good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Healthline Policy Seminar Series. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people and to uh, give thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Joanna Erdman and I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. Um, and this is our last seminar uh, for the 2017-18 academic uh, year. And this year we've been uh, really celebrating the interdisciplinary nature of the field. So looking to the different theories and methods of health law and policy. Our presenters have come from many different fields of its practice. Uh, and today it's my great pleasure to welcome a longtime friend, uh, Professor uh, Y.Y. Chen from the University of Ottawa's uh, Faculty of Law. Y.Y. is a uh, lawyer and a social worker by training. And so he has intersectionality right in his uh, very self. Um, but it also translates into his research program in quite a unique way. Um, so the methods he uses, uh, action research and community engagement, the legal fields he occupies, health and immigration law, and the health inequities that he studies uh, at the intersection of migrant health, race and marginalization, and social citizenship and belonging. Um, and indeed, YY and I worked together quite closely last year on the fifth edition of the new textbook, which is Canadian Health Law and Policy. Uh, and I really want to note uh, YY's contribution to this textbook. Uh, he wrote the chapter on social determinants of health and marginalized populations. And why his contribution is so significant is because this is the first time ever that the textbook has had a chapter on social determinants of health and marginalized <laughs> populations. So it's a really unique contribution uh, and something quite exciting for the field. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, YY to present on the challenge of migration and healthcare solidarity in liberal democracies. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today um, at Dow. Actually, this is the first time I've ever stepped foot at Dow. So <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I have, I have um, for a long time, uh, admired the vibrant health law program here um, from afar. So, so it truly is um, an, an honor for me to be here today. And I'm grateful for this opportunity um, to, to share some of my work with you. And, and just before I start, I want to thank Joanna and the organizers of this um, seminar for giving, giving me this opportunity. All right, so um, the topic of my presentation today touches on um, the concept of healthcare solidarity. So I came to this topic um, as part of my ongoing work that tries to untangle the normative debate around healthcare entitlement and access for international migrants. Um, as someone that has closely followed uh, that debate um, about whether or not and to what extent we um, should afford migrants healthcare, um, publicly financed healthcare, um, I keep seeing this notion of membership and solidarity popping up in that discourse. Most often, uh, it has been used as an argument to limit migrants' health care entitlement. Okay. So, I don't know how many of you have seen or remember this. Um, so, this is a flyer that was sent out by Saskatchewan MP Kaylee Block a few years back uh, when the federal government significantly scaled back the um, public health care coverage for refugees and refugee claimants. And so the flyer was entitled, Working Hard For You, right? Um, and it and reads in part, quote, new arrivals to Canada has received dental and vision care paid by your tax dollars, right? Not anymore. And so underlying this message, to me anyway, is a clear sense of us versus them. Um, as the argument goes, Healthcare is a resource reserved for us, being members of the Canadian society, 
And migrants are not such members, or at least not yet. And this lack of membership somehow justifies their exclusion from our healthcare program. Right? At the same time, a bit less frequently, um, we do see membership and solidarity based argument being advanced by those positioning themselves on the other side of the debate. So going back to this example um, of when the federal refugee health care program was cut in 2012, uh, as many of you know, the policy change was met with strong opposition led by health care professionals. Um, and they have organized protests across the country. So let's take a look at this placard um, spotted one of these protests. Right, so it reads, Stop cuts to refugee health care. Canada is a country of immigrants. Now to me, right, this notion of Canada being a country of immigrants is a membership-based argument. Right? A broader concept of membership than we saw being portrayed in the previous slide, but a membership-based argument nonetheless. Right? The idea here is that we understand, if we understand um, the Canadian society in a certain way, uh, then the scope of what constitutes us should properly, uh, should properly encompass newcomers. And so, so these different conceptions of um, membership, in my view, suggest the fuzziness of the notion of membership and solidarity, at least in the healthcare context. And without first clarifying what exactly is meant by us when we use the word membership, solidarity, and so on, I think it is difficult to have a meaningful debate around whether migrants are or are not right, part of the solidarity that anchors our healthcare system. And so that is the subject um, that I'd like for us to explore today. Clarifying the nature of solidarity in healthcare context, and in turn, considering how migrants may be positioned in relation to such healthcare solidarity. And so with that in mind, my presentation will proceed as follows. So um, I will first explain the concept of solidarity and its link to healthcare. So here I'm hoping to convince you um, that solidarity plays an important role in our system of healthcare um, resource allocation. As such, solidarity-based arguments relating to whether migrants should or should not be included in our healthcare program merits our attention. Next, I will put forth several ways that healthcare solidarity could be conceptualized and propose to you that constitutional patriotism as opposed to nationalism or uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, best explains healthcare solidarity as we understand it today in Western liberal democracies. And finally, I will conclude by considering what the implication may be for migrants if I'm right that healthcare solidarity in liberal democratic states such as ours is at present best conceptualized in constitutional patriotic terms. And so the main point that I'm trying to make is this, right? Even if we follow a membership and solidarity based argument, which again has most often been used by those seeking to limit migrants' healthcare coverage, the way that membership and solidarity is generally understood in liberal democ uh, democracies today will in fact necessitate us to extend healthcare entitlement to more migrants than we have typically um, done. And that is, there are some migrants that are currently part of our healthcare solidarity, but have, been, have not been recognized as such, or has not been treated as such. And this, I suggest to you, is unjust. So I'll just make one more uh, comment before I dive into my presentation. So I understand that the term migrant can be um, understood differently by different people. 
So for my purpose here today, I'm using it to mean anyone that, um, that has moved from one country to another and that their stay in that receiving country is more than transitory. And so this would include immigrants, refugees, people who are um, in the country for a substantial period of time uh, while holding um, temporary legal statuses or no status at all. Okay, so that's, um, those are the people that I'm referring to when I use the word migrants. And so in other words, I'm using the word migrants as an umbre umbrella term today, um, mostly just for convenience. Um, although I do recognize that many people have argued that refugees and migrants um, should perhaps be di distinguished in our, our um, use of the term just because of the different nature of their migration. But again, I'm just going to use the, the, the term migrants today to kind of as a catch-all phrase. Okay? So with that in mind, let me now briefly flesh out the concept of social solidarity and its link to healthcare. So in a nutshell, social solidarity refers to a form of group identification that is capable of inspiring non-calculating cooperation among group members. Right? So it embodies both a feeling of togetherness and an active commitment by people to working together for a common cause. According to Emil Durkheim, solidarity can be generated um, in multiple ways. Right? So it can be generated when people find themselves in the company of other people that share similar traits, or um, when people collaborate with one another in a common project. And so this notion of solidarity is often linked to the pursuit of universal healthcare coverage. For example, as you can see on this slide, in the Canadian government's 2016 report to the Parliament regarding the Canada Health Act, it was suggested that the Canadian healthcare insurance system is undergirded by these values of equity and solidarity. And similarly, if we looked um, across the Atlantic Ocean, if we look at the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, <clears throat> Article 35 of that charter guarantees everyone a right to health care. And you'll find that that article was placed under Chapter 4, which is entitled Solidarity. Okay. So what exactly is the role played by solidarity in universal health care? Today, although there are notable holdout, uh, holdouts, the um, prevailing view is that the achievement of universal health care coverage entails significant state-imposed reallocation of resources and responsibilities right, from the rich to the poor, from the healthy to the infirmed, the able-bodied persons to individuals living with disabilities, and from the relatively young to the elderly. Now, such state-imposed reallocation of resources require justification. Otherwise, it appears, at least prima facie, right, to um, be um, in tension with personal autonomy. Now, one role that solidarity plays in the context of healthcare is to contribute to the legitimacy of mandatory healthcare redistribution. It does so by promoting individuals to agree to um, forego, health, uh, forego their immediate advantage, right, for the sake of meeting the needs of other people. And as communitarian theorists such as David Miller would argue, right, without such solidarity, there's little obligation on people to help out um, a complete stranger, perhaps except in um, cases of emergency maybe, or if somehow um, we have caused the stranger's plight. And therefore, generally speaking, the extent of healthcare redistribution must coincide with that of social solidarity. Right? Mandatory redistribution that goes beyond the reach of um, solidarity will require additional justification for it to be legitimate and redistribution that comes short 
of the scope of solidarity unjustly excludes individuals that have made sacrifices um, so as to enable that distribution of resources to happen in the first place. But what are the boundaries of healthcare solidarity? So the answer to that question, I think, depends on the nature of such solidarity. That is, if we can figure out what gives rise to healthcare solidarity, then we can start to delineate how far that solidarity goes. And so a, a review of literature suggests that solidarity can stem from at least three sources, right? Nationalist identification, cosmopolitan worldview, and constitutional patriotism. Now, each of these accounts of solidarity understands solidarity's boundaries differently. And so the task in front of us then is to analyze which of these forms of solidarity underlies universal healthcare system like the one we have here in Canada. This in turn will allow us to assess who should properly be part of our healthcare solidarity, therefore our health um, resource allocation, right? And to what extent migrant should be included in that resource reallocation. Okay, so now let me say a few words about how I analyze the nature of healthcare solidarity. Right? That is, how do I choose from among these three concepts of solidarity that I have presented to you, um, for one, that best anchors universal healthcare system. Now, first of all, as the title of my talk today suggests, I limit my analysis to healthcare solidarity in Western liberal democracies. I'm cognizant of the fact that um, countries of a different political tradition may well conceptualize uh, membership right, in different ways. Moreover, countries around the world exhibit a wide range um, of income levels, which impact on the extent of healthcare that, um, that can realistically be, be provided publicly, right, irrespective of concerns about solidarity. <coughs> so the precise question that I'm wrestling with is then um, as follows, right? So how do Western liberal democracies understand the nature of healthcare solidarity that binds their respective citizens? Now in terms of the actual process that I take to answer that question, um, my point of departure is what I observe as this near consensus among Western liberal dem democracies, which says uh, public health care coverage should be made available right, to all resident citizens who cannot afford to pay privately. Now, obviously, the United States is a clear outlier to this uh, international trend, but putting the United States aside, every other Western liberal democracies um, now has some form of national program that aim at ensuring adequate healthcare coverage for all resident citizens. Now this policy agreement, I think, allows us to use it as a benchmark for testing the various conceptions of healthcare solidarity. That is, a valid account of um, healthcare solidarity must have the capacity to at least properly explain that status quo, right? As such, the nature of inquiry that I'm pursuing here is more positivist than normative. So my, object, uh, my objective is not so much to articulate a theory of healthcare solidarity that should exist in Western liberal democracies, Rather, I'm interested in identifying the form of solidarity that best explains the current um, arrangement of healthcare redistribution in Western liberal democracies. Right? And what this current form of healthcare solidarity says about the extent to which migrants can or cannot be seen as part of us. Okay? 
So what I'll do now is to just go over each of those three accounts of solidarity that I've presented to you and assess how well they can explain this policy consensus among Western liberal democracies that says healthcare resource redistribution should involve at least all citizens. Now ultimately, as I've already identified for you, uh, my conclusion is that constitutional patriotism best explains the type of solidarity that is needed right, to support such ubiquitous ubiquitous uh, inclusion of resident citizen in our healthcare system today. And so the first form of solidarity that I'm going to examine is nationalist solidarity. <clears throat> I trust that the various theories of nationalism are um, are, are going to be familiar to many of you. Um, central to the nationalist doctrine right, is this concept of a nation. And that nation supposedly consists of a group of individuals who come to identify themselves by certain common identities and believe that because of that common identity, they ought to associate with one another more closely Right, than humankind in general. And in this sense, the commonality shared by, co-national, uh, by co-nationals is what I will call pre-political. Right? It is what gives rise to nation states. So it happens before nation state. Right? And therefore, it's relatively fixed. Right? It's, the, it's the foundation to, to a nation state. Any newcomers wishing to be considered a co-national must adopt themselves to this fixed, shared identity of that nation. Now, of course, there are different versions of nationalism, and they characterize the common identity of a nation differently. Right? So, for example, ethnic, eth- uh, ethnic national- or nationalism, sorry, Ethnic nationalism sees co-nationals as um, a homogenous group right, that's distinctive uh, in terms of their cultural and linguistic backgrounds. And that group is attached to a homeland and share a common lineage, much like an extended family. Right, that's ethnic nationalism. On the other hand, liberal or civic nationalism characterizes um, common identity of a nation in terms of some shared um, value. But whether it is shared ethnicity or shared values, the common national identity proposed here right, supposedly give rise to a solidarity, uh, solidarity right, a, a bond between co-nationals. And it is generally accepted by theorists that such nationalist solidarity indeed has that sufficient strength to legitimize and facilitate sustained redistribution among individuals within, uh, that come within its ambit. And in fact, if we look historically, that seems um, quite uh, plausible, right? We see that national ties can motivate individuals to accept even much greater degree of self-sacrifices than agreeing to mandatory um, resource redistribution, right, including going to war. So can nationalist solidarity explain the system of healthcare that exists in Western liberal democracies um, where coverage is extended to all resident citizens? Now, I'm of the view that while nationalist solidarity may have the thickness right, to motivate healthcare redistribution, it alone lacks the necessary reach um, to justify the inclusion of all citizens of the modern Western states in such redistribution. Contemporary Western liberal democracies are increasingly, if not already, multinational or uh, multicultural. 
And this, in my view, poses a problem for nationalism, right, as an explanation for our current healthcare arrangement. This is particularly the case in countries um, that consider themselves multinational, right, namely consisting of more than one nation. So nationalist solidarity by itself says nothing about how solidarity can be generated across these different national groupings. And yet, even in these national or multinational states, right, such as Canada, Belgium, and Switzerland, we see healthcare extended to all citizens across that un uh, national divide. Now, what about countries that are multicultural? Could nationalist solidarity underpin healthcare resource redistribution in those countries for all citizens? Well, I think it depends. Right? In my view, an ethnic version of nationalism would have a hard time explaining the apparent healthcare solidarity that, uh, that's across citizens from different ethno-racial backgrounds. But even if we adopt the civic version of nationalism that rests um, on shared values. In a pluralistic society, I'm having some difficulty identifying just what values could serve as, uh, as that, that, that glue, right? that binds, that unify that large group of people together. Now, of course, there are going to be some um, more universal values, such as equality, right, liberty, and so on, that could be shared by co-nationals. But as we start to rely on these universal values as an anchor for solidarity, I would suggest to you that that account of nationalism starts to look very much like what I would propose to you as constitutional patriotism. And in fact, in my view, Constitutional patriotism provides a much more robust account of how such universal values right, could actually generate sufficient solidarity among citizens of a state. And so based on those reasons, I think a nationalist account of healthcare solidarity falls short. And next, I'm going to turn my attention to cosmopolitan solidarity. So at the heart of cosmopolitan solidarity, or at least um, cosmopolitan philosophy, is a notion of the world as a community made up of all humankind. And what unites us all is our human nature, right? namely a set of universal concerns that typify human experiences. And that would include, for example, our bodily needs, our capacity to experience emotions, our ability to reason, and our inclination to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. And out of all this shared humanity, it is said that we develop a sense of solidarity with one another. Now, many proponents of immigrants and refugees' um, public health care coverage have adopted this cosmopolitan view on solidarity. So sometimes this is framed in humanitarian terms, which zero in on the hardship associated with ill health as something that all human beings can relate to. Right? And therefore, we should try as much as possible to try to help people avoid that hardship. Others have couched their cosmopolitan ethics in terms of human rights and stressed the entitlement of all human beings to timely and appropriate health care as essential to the protection of human dignity. Now, such cosmopolitan solidarity, if, ex if it actually exists, um, clearly has that potential to explain universal health care program, let alone for citizens right, in Western uh, liberal democracies. Now, as much as I wish that were the case, however, I think it is not a stretch for me to say that whatever pan-human consciousness that we currently have, it lacks the strength or 
thickness to qualify as a proper form of solidarity. Right? At this moment, the communal feeling in the global context is quite weak, I would argue, especially when compared with more particularistic ties that individuals also form with one another on the basis such as kinship, religion, nationality, and so on. And so nowhere, perhaps, is this more um, discernible than the, I guess, personally, I would say, disappointing responses taken today by countries around the world in response to the ever-growing number of refugees from around the world. And solidarity among countries appear difficult to come by. And so what this shows to me anyway is that, rightly or wrongly, domestic interests currently remain much more determinative right, than the sense of pan-human camaraderie when it comes to government decision making. As such, I do not believe that cosmopolitan solidarity is a viable explanation, right now anyway, for the level of healthcare redistribution taking place in Western liberal democracies. Okay. And so finally, I turn my analysis to the theory of constitutional patriotism. Now, unlike its nationalist and cosmopolitan counterparts, constitutional patriotic solidarity, I argue, has both the reach and the intensity required to explain the liberal democratic healthcare policy consensus. This is so because constitutional patriotic solidarity mediates between nationalist and cosmopolitan um, solidarity. Right, essentially, what the theory of cosmo sorry, uh, uh, the theory of constitutional patriotism seeks to do is to marry a shared attachment towards some high-level universalistic uh, principles with the actualization of these principles in the form of particular um, national institutions. So, like nationalism, uh, constitutional patriotism is admittedly particularistic. That is, it refers to loyalty to and camaraderie within a bounded political community, right, instead of all humankind. This allows constitutional patriotism um, to generate that kind of solidarity to maintain a level of robustness Right, that is not too watered down. But unlike nationalism, constitutional patriotic solidarity is not anchored by some shared personal trait or common values among um, community members. Rather, the, that solidarity, right, that bond um, between people, stems from a shared constitutionally guaranteed practice of deliberation and policy making, in which people recognize each other as free and equal participants. So to put it differently, what binds constitutional patriotic, um, I guess, individual or subjects together, right? It's a set of procedures and the attendant institutions through which individuals can collectively generate representations of their identity. And so in my view, this procedural turn is what allows constitutional patriotic solidarity to move beyond the constraint of identity politics and extend universally across all members of a polity. Now you might ask, well, just how does this set of abstract procedures generate loyalty and particularistic attachment. Well, according to constitutional patriotic theorists, um, solidarity comes about when the processes and institutions of deliberation unfold within a specific context. That is, the form, right, and sometimes the outcome of democratic deliberation, controversies, and disagreement will be shaped by historical context, institutional arrangements, 
and legal traditions, among other things, which are all specific to a country. Right, so for example, contemporary debate about and the struggle for ethno-racial equality in Europe may be more nuanced by the legacy of Holocaust. Whereas similar discussion in North America may be more underscored by the uh, history of colonialism and slavery. Right, so because of that historical context, even though we're talking about perhaps a similar set of deliberation and principles, it unfolds in a different way. And it is this way of constitutional patriotic um, deliberation, right, that gives it um, specific, uh, specificity, right? It gives its uh, particularistic nature. And so despite the fact that it has broader scope than, um, than nationalistic um, um, identities, it's still able to command the self-sacrifices of members of a particular state. And so in other words, the willingness of citizens to share healthcare resources among themselves, I argue, right, at present anyway, is primarily inspired by this recognition of one another as equal participants in a continuous process of deliberation, reflection, and adjustment, which contribute to a collective constitutional culture. Okay. So, having settled on constitutional patriotism as the source of healthcare solidarity in Western liberal democracies, I argue that any migrant that can be said to partake in society's deliberation are to also be granted entitlement to publicly funded health care, much like their citizens' counterpart. And so in making this claim, I want to highlight that migrants' participation, right, their participation in society's deliberation can take a wide range of forms um, beyond political uh, participation in its strictest sense. So clearly, many migrants cannot vote in elections. And if we restrict our understanding of what it counts as participating in democratic deliberation to voting alone, then migrants would seem to fall outside of our healthcare solidarity. But it is important to know that migrants are not incapable of voting, right? Many newcomers um, to Canada would be readily um, take part in that franchise if given an opportunity, right? So it is that they de they're denied the right to, to engage in that institution. Now in the meantime, the lack of right to vote has not stopped migrants from partaking in discussions and debate. And they do so, right, with the view to shape the policy directions of our society through personal interactions, community events, volunteering, participation in organizations such as labor unions, and so on, many migrants are actively taking part in the dialogue right, that shape our policy decisions. Now, if you just do a quick scan of newspaper headlines, it will yield plenty of examples. Right here, we see a group of refugee youth sought to tell their stories by creating an online magazine. Right? And then here is a, a news article about events um, that's being organized in Victoria, BC, where refugees and indigenous communities try to learn more about each other. And then here are a couple of examples where refugees sought to, quote, give back to Canada, right, by donating their blood, their time, and so on. And so my point here is not that migrants should be considered part of us because somehow they have contributed to our society. I mean, yes, it's important to recognize migrants' contribution, which is often lost in our migrant healthcare debate. But what I'm trying to make, um, the point I'm trying to make here is, 
is a little different. What, I'm, what I mean to convey here is that there are different ways that migrants seek to voice their views. And these examples of giving back to Canada are just another way that migrants express their perspective and take part in the democratic discourse. And insofar as such participation right, in the deliberative process is what anchors our present-day healthcare solidarity, I argue that a case can be made to extend healthcare entitlement to more migrants than we currently do um, in liberal democracies. Okay, so that's where I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very thank much. You. So we have lots of time uh, for <coughs> questions, conversation. So thanks very much, Wai Wai. Um, it was really fun to think through this idea of access to healthcare turning on a demonstration of participation in the polity um, and thinking about how radical that is as a way sort of from the bottom up to ground our sort of who gets healthcare and who doesn't that's tied to sort of participating in democracy. But I guess I wanted to invite you to, to think through it, it, it even more in terms of how it might be institutionalized. Because what I worry about a little bit is that if it becomes an empirical or fact-based question about how much you're participating, even though as you ended on a very sort of inclusive or broad definition of what participation might look about, when I think about it being institutionalized and thinking about existing structures that we have that are involved in giving people status as refugees or not, that fact-based inquiry I could see working quite in the opposite direction, such that only this level of participation will count, and without that, your health care access is quite limited or denied entirely. And so when you think about institutionalizing this kind of project, um, do you have worries along the lines of suggesting, or, or yeah. what's your counter to that? No, I, I, I definitely agree with that concern, right? And I think, generally speaking, um, that's a concern whenever we adopt um, a more membership-based kind of argument, right? So all this con uh, discussion about healthcare solidarity, by nature, is a membership-based argument. Anytime we want to kind of decide who's member, who's not, right? Whether it's based on participation or by some other ground, they're always going to come up to a point where someone is going to be le left out. And so I do recognize that's, a, that's potentially an issue, especially, in in, as you said, if we institutionalize that. Um, so what, the point I'm trying to make here is not that this should be the only ground that anchors our decision making, right, in terms of who should get health care and who shouldn't. What I'm trying to do here is a more kind of a modest proposal, which is to say that, you know, there are people who are trying to use this membership-based argument to kind of exclude migrants from health care access or entitlement. And I'm trying to say, well, even if we follow that line of thought, right, more people should be covered under our health care than it's currently or most uh, often being prepared to, um, to cover in terms of the scope. But there are um, going to be other, um, other under, uh, normative underpinnings right, as to why we should provide health care to some people other than membership-based arguments. Right? Human rights being one of those, humanitarianism, right, and, and so on. And it, there could be also policy reasons that looking at ec economics and so on. So, so I do recognize that, that, that fear. Um, and, but I think that that's an inherent um, problem with membership-based argument in of self. Yeah. That me? Uh, just, a, just a couple things. In terms of your account of constitutional patriotism, you, I, you well described the process and sort of the context piece, but um, you didn't <coughs> talk much about the, you know, what you're referring to as universal, universalist values. Maybe a little more elaboration on that would be one thing. The other, the, the account that you're favoring, you talk about uh, dialogical discourse and the participation of, I guess, the potential participation of migrants. And, and I'm thinking that, yeah, if you break the migrants down into the powerful and the powerless, you know, in terms of financially and whatever, there's a huge segment, segment of, of, of migrants that don't participate, you know, empirically in, in deliberative discourse. They just don't have the power to do so. 
So what does that do to your account? And the last piece would be just does does this account that you're providing you know, your per, your preference? Is it does it does it provide a better account than simply adding human rights and you know human rights and also equal moral worth of all persons? As you know, does it add much? Is, is it when you frame it as that or this? You know, how does it come up? So, um, in terms of your question about the role of universal values, right, that's doing in the um, constitutional patriotism theory, essentially, those, um, the idea there, we're, what we're talking about usually, right, in terms of liberal democrat democratic uh, states, we're talking about values, as I mentioned, um, equality, right, liberty, um, and um, democratic participation, right? So those are the kind of the general um, values that we're referring to. But what uh, uh, constitutional patriotism is saying is that solidarity doesn't generate, doesn't come out from those very broad principles. It's how those principles get translated through institutions in that deliberative process. Right? And, so, and so it's that, um, that procedural turn, as I mentioned, that anchors solidarity. But just to answer your question, so that's the values that we're looking for, really quite um, kind of high level values. Um, in terms of your two other questions, let me answer your last question first, which is how do we, um, whether or not this account of, um, you know, in, in terms of basing healthcare coverage on the uh, um, on solidarity, how does that compare to accounts such as um, human rights and equal um, moral worth? I think again, you know, I think those two uh, two approaches are there are simply different approaches, right? And I don't necessarily think that they exclude one another, um, even though you're right. So in terms of um, membership-based argument, as I um, kind of alluded to when I was explaining. Um, to Matthew's question, it's going, there's always going to come a, a line that you just have to draw, right, with who's part of us and who's not. But, you know, I think there's always ways for us to kind of expand that line as, you know, as, as far out as possible to, to include as many people as possible. But the idea is that within that boundary, right, it, there is that, that um, equal moral worth. And so part of part of what this membership-based argument can do, right, is to, to add to the human rights argument by clarifying who's responsible for providing um, health care. Right, so we understand that, yes, you know, based on um, human dignity arguments, right, everyone is entitled or has the right to health, and part of that is health care, right? But as, at least internationally, it's not very clear in terms of our international <coughs> human rights norms it doesn't really say a whole lot about who's responsible for meeting those rights. And so a lot of times what we see is in a receiving society, you will have countries that say, well, sure, you have rights, but it's your original, your, your uh, country of origin that should be responsible for covering your health care. Why are we paying for your health care? Right? And so, so part of the membership argument, what, you know, can, can do, right, to serve that purpose is to say that, well, no, if we conceptualize these people as our members, then the duty to fulfill that right to health care falls upon the receiving state. So, so you know, I'm hoping that it does add something to the, to the human rights discourse, um, but, but you're right. So, you know, oftentimes, um, it, you know, it, it falls short when compared to human rights discourse insofar as it's, it's reach. Um, and then your, your second question um, touches on kind of the empirical evidence, right? So who actually participates, right? And actually, can they, you know, can migrants actually participate? Um, as, you know, as, as I already alluded to, when we're talking about in the context of voting, right, people are not allowed to participate in that form. And there are other ways that people, uh, that, that migrants are limited in terms of the capacity to, to participate. Um, the, 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 their social economic circumstances, for example, might not allow them to do a lot of this participation that will qualify them as um, part of our healthcare solidarity. But I think my argument here, though, is a lot of those um, 
a lot of those limitations, it's state-imposed, right? And a lot of those state-imposed limitations are, uh, are grounded in this idea of us versus them. Um, and so it's, it becomes a bit of a circular, right? So you know, people can participate because we don't recognize them as us, and, and therefore, they, you know, because we don't recognize them as us, we don't give them proper opportunities and ways to support their, their participation. And so it, it kind of, you know, kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so ideally, when we're discussing um, people's participation and their ground for healthcare solidarity, I would like to suggest it's not just whether or not they actually participated, but whether or not they have the, you know, whether or not um, there is the, if given the opportunity, right, could we say these are a group of people that usually can participate in our, our um, democratic uh, deliberation process? That, that's how I would kind of frame it. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much uh, for, your, for your talk. I'm curious. Um, when you talk about this being sort of an economy of participation as grounding solidarity as a, a sort of framing justification for uh, redistribution, um, you're sort of talking about one end of a participation spectrum where there's barriers or preclusions that sort of limit the capacity to, to participate and how that somehow maps onto uh, a less grounded form of entitlement under this solid solidarity model because of the lack of participation, there's less solidarity identified with or associated with that grants uh, health entitlements. But how would this model account for, for instance, the veteran community, where you've got maybe the highest perceived form of participation through a nationalistic, cosmopolitan, constitutional patriotism sort of map, when those health entitlements are called into question, when they're changed through policy, uh, when they're maybe uh, you know, undermined in certain ways, whether that complicates the participation model, because uh, you have possibly at least what would be identified within that nationalistic discourse, this sort of highest form of civic participation, um, that should correlate to the highest form of health entitlements under the solidarity model. And in a lot of instances, it might not, because it's equally subject to policy shift, equally subject to different governments coming through. So it's sort of less of a static economy that just sort of there's, a, there's a baseline, more participation equals more health entitlements. Um, it seems to fluctuate a bit more than that. I'm sort of curious how that other side of the no, that's that's a great question. Um, I I mean I, I just want to clarify one point though. I don't I don't think that I'm trying to suggest that there is a necessary correlation between how much you participate and how much health care you should get. Right? And I think what I'm trying to say is that there is a baseline, right? In terms of, I mean it's almost kind of you kind of have you have participated to a certain extent, right? That should entitle you to to kind of the full uh, extent of health care that you extend to citizens. I think that if we, I, if we look among the, um, just within the, the um, citizen uh, population, you know, without looking at um, migrants, I mean, we don't really go into any detail in terms of trying to kind of deciphering how much people participate, right? We just can simply say that, well, you know, we assume that you're citizens and there is a level of participation that generally comes with your citizenship, right? Um, we don't really go into that much detail in terms of empirical uh, analysis. And I mean, that could be for good reasons. It's just sometimes it's difficult to measure how much people actually participate, right? And so I, I, I'm not trying to make an empirical claim here. What I'm trying to do is to say that I mean, it seems, it seems to be the case that, that um, being a part of that deliberative process, right, that seems to be what's important when it comes to solidarity. And once you're part of that process, that should entitle you to the same amount of um, health care. You should be treated with respect um, to health care anyway, right, equally to anyone that, that comes, that come engage in that process. Um, but the, of course, there's always, also always going to be fluctuation in terms of actual policy implementation, right? I, what I'm trying to do here is a very kind of the foray into this um, field, trying to figure out what's kind of at the macro level, what's the, th the, the theoretical account for, for health, uh, healthcare solidarity. Um, it, healthcare solidarity is not carved in stone, right? Uh, solidarity changes all the, all the time. Um, it's, 
um, you know, how we feel, right? who we think that we are together with can change. Um, and so that speaks to another point, right? If we, we, if we um, see constitutional patriotism as, some, as a model of solidarity that we want to foster, then it requires work, right? It requires us as a society to, um, to, to enhance, to maintain that solidarity by allowing ongoing um, deliberation among people and engaging all the citizenry as much as possible within that delivery uh, process. Right? Otherwise, we can revert it um, back to um, nationalist solidarity, for example, right? and that will look very different when it comes to actual um, health care coverage, in my opinion. Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to... Oh, thanks. thanks. So I, I think one area, I mean, I think why your research is quite exciting is because it's really at this intersection of immigration and health law, um, which is a rather unique intersection in the field. Uh, so I, I want to start with a question about, again, participation. I think it's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting proposal uh, in the sense of thinking about solidarity in terms of participation. And I'll start with a kind of uh, thinking of a negative <laughs> on it and then maybe to a positive. So the negative is on that immigration health intersection. You think that if participation becomes your mark of a threshold, well, that is highly manipulable by government, especially on immigration rules. Yeah. Right? And so you can think about interdiction efforts, which are quite a uh, uh, direct way of literally physically limiting the capacity of migrants to enter the space. And so you could think in more metaphoric ways about the same kind of use of rules to be able to limit people's participation if participation comes to be the normative grounding of solidarity. And I thought that that was a kind of interesting thing to think about in light of your two areas of expertise, immigration rules, which are precisely to control movement and space uh, with healthcare law. Yeah. Uh, and my second question is um, a kind of positive piece on participation, which I really like. And it's participation in the sense of, and it was an understanding of solidarity that you use in the opening couple of slides, which is participation in a common project. And I think here you're kind of a common project is deliberative democracy. Um, but when Medicare was first established, right, in the kind of idea of a universal health system, there was a sense of healthcare being connected to the national project, right? Like healthcare was not, universal healthcare was not only for the good of the health of individual people or even a group of people, it was seen as a nation building project. And so I wonder then what that does in terms of a theory of solidarity as participation. And I was thinking in light of Trudeau's you know, recent announcements around, let's say, even take a budget recently, or his ideas about immigration. I mean, what kind of project is he building in terms of a constitutional patriotic, uh, patriotic project there? I think he's linking a lot of a sense of rights and entitlements to a same kind of nation building project, yeah. but maybe in constitutional terms. And I wonder, therefore, because of course we've had this major political regime change from Harper to Trudeau, and what would Trudeau's project look like in light of extending or really just guaranteeing healthcare benefits in light of a, if you like, constitutional project or a nation building project in Trudeau's imagination? No, I, I think yeah, I definitely agree with you, right? In terms of the, the last observation there, like I think, you know, I think that the beauty about constitutional patriotism is the fact that, you know, contrary to nationalism, which I describe as more pre-political, right? Constitutional patriotism, it's, some, it's something that's ongoing, right? Because it's, it focuses on that procedure of deliberation. So it's post-political in a way that we can generate solidarity I just keep talking to each other and allowing difference to, ch um, to surface and to, ch to uh, try to change you know, different directions that our, con uh, our, our constitutional project will go, right? And so, so it, it be I, I, to me, that is more of a, um, I guess, welcoming or inclusive um, way of thinking about solidarity when it comes to, um, to, to, to migrants. But do you think Trudeau is definitively not about a procedural? I mean, he has a substantive vision 
of Canada and its uh, health and well-being uh, that at least right in rhetoric is about a more inclusive and participatory yeah. type of, to a vision substantively versus just a, a procedural. True, um, but I guess my, my, my take on that is, well, you know, at the end of the day, he's still using the institutions that we have, right, to kind of, to, uh, to express that, that view, right, and to institute that view if he so wish. And so, and that, that institution allows multiple views to be expressed um, to compete with each, uh, uh, with each other, and eventually it might reach, you know, certain, um, it might formulate certain way, formalize in a certain way, but it can be changed later on. And so, I mean, I, I think the beauty about constitutional patriotism is that you don't necessarily have to agree with Trudeau, for example, right? Like, you can still say that, you know, I feel a loyalty to Canada, Right, without believing in this, this kind of vision that Trudeau is trying to, to sell, because I believe in the fact that uh, of this kind of institution, this um, the deliberative process that at least Trudeau is trying to, to follow. Right? I think that's what the constitutional patriot uh, theory would, would argue. Um, but I think going, just going back to your first um, comment about the intersection between health and, and, and immigration. So you're right. Um, at the end of the day, what the government can always do is just to block people, right? So, I mean, we don't even talk about health. Let's just deal everything with the immigration, uh, in the immigration sphere, right? If you're not here physically, anyway, you're, there's just no, no discussion about health, period. Um, and then, so health almost serves as additional layer of that immigration control, right? So for those people who are able to kind of come in through our physical borders, then immigration, uh, so their, 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 their control in terms of immigration um, takes the form of access to social services, health care, and so on. And so, so yes, so there is certain, I, I, I recognize that there are limits in terms of um, understanding um, solidarity on the basis of membership. Um, I still think, though, um, it's, it's still a better model than than the nationalist understanding of solidarity. And you know, I, by all means, I, I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm not trying to propose that this is the best account of solidarity that we can have, right? Perhaps today we want to move to a more kind of cosmopolitan solidarity. And there's, I don't think that there's, um, theoretically speaking anyway, I don't think there's anything that's stopping us from doing that. What we need to do then is to cultivate that sense of solidarity, right? More on the international level. And perhaps one day, right, that can be the underpinning of our healthcare solidarity. And so I think, you know, I'm not trying to kind of say we sh this is the participation is the one that we should go with. I think it's the best that we, at least in my opinion, and the best account um, that for our current model that we have. Sorry, there's, there was one. I don't operate in this space of theory very well, so I'm bringing down a more practical level than applied level because I, I work in, um, in the community. I'm on the board of the Halifax Refugee Clinic, which is a legal clinic here in Halifax. Um, and we maybe have got it all wrong, you know, in our, in our advocacy messaging, in our public awareness raising, appealing to universally, um, universal human rights, um, talking about humanitarianism, maybe we're getting it all wrong. So I'd like your advice on how to translate um, constitutional solidarity to an advocacy message. And when you see headlines like this, you know, there's so much baggage behind this, these kinds of headlines requiring refugees to be grateful for yeah. us opening our doors, right? As Canadians, we don't need to be grateful if we're able to be born here, but these people need to be grateful for us Letting them in to our borders. So, um, and just, yeah, get your, I'd like to get your advice on how do you translate that to a message that's palatable to the voting public and to health policymakers? No, that's a great question. Um, so, so, I mean, I would say, right, I, very, um, it, as much as possible, right, like if we can somehow use more of a membership argument, right? Like to try to, I mean, I'm not trying to discount the human rights argument. I think that that line of argument should still be part of your advocacy, 
Right? Again, I, again, I, just going back to the point I just want to keep emphasizing, I'm not trying to say this should be the argument that you know, one and only argument that we should use to promote health care. Right? So I'm not saying you, know, you should by all means continue with human rights-based argument. Um, but you know, perhaps we should, can also pay more attention to counter arguments that says you know, they're not part of us, right? to kind of challenge that discourse to say, well, who actually is part of us? Right? And what is your matrix when it comes to assessing who's part of us and who's not? And if your matrix today is you know, nationalism or right? Eth eth ethnicity, for example, well, I mean, that doesn't work, right? Even if you look at our, you know, who we count as um, citizens today, right? And so, so just trying to challenge that logic a little bit, right? And to say, well, you know, perhaps our, our account of who we, who, who us is, should be broader than, than the, a lot of what opponents um, to migrant health care or even refugees specifically, right, um, has proposed. So what logic does that play? The taxi driver that I was with when I was on, I was actually en route to a Halifax refugee clinic fundraiser, and I told him where I was going, and he himself, he's Lebanese, and I always like to talk to taxi drivers about where they're from, um, and he, his, he'd only been in Canada about 20 years, but his reaction to this event for refugee claimants was very hostile. Why are we letting in more of these people? Um, and we can't afford to support these people. And he's probably referring in part to health care as well as other kinds of social support. So what logic is at play there? What kind of solidarity is missing for that taxi driver? Right. I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I, I can't, uh, you know, trying to kind of um, pretend that I know what's behind the, the person's thinking. But I think you know it's it's quite often. I mean, it's not a one-off kind of example, right? We see that quite often. Um, you know, I would just say that a lot of times, there you know, solidarity is one consideration, right? But there are also uh, our our calculation, our, our thinking, right? It's it's not always solidarity based. In fact, oftentimes are not solidarity based. And so you know, there are various other factors that could influence how what why this person believed the way that. Um, that he did. Um, perhaps it's self-interest, perhaps it's you know, something else. I, I just, I can't really speak to that. Um, but you know, the only thing I would say is, you know, it, it, there's always, you know, part of the solidarity, if you want to generate that, is through deliberation, right? So the more that you can engage with people with different views and just engage in this kind of dialogue, that in itself, I think it's good um, in, in building that solidarity. Great. Thank I think you uh, very much. I'm sorry we don't have time for, but did you want to just uh, maybe share your question with um, everyone, but you can follow up after? Yeah. Um, so my argument is we kind of do already base our, our membership on participation. So here in Nova Scotia, for example, if your work permit is only for five months, no coverage. But if you're here for more than 12 months, sure, we'll give you coverage. Same with international students same kind of idea. So I'm wondering how you don't see that as already the way that we do things. Um, and my second question is, how as um, individual provinces and territories can we ever try to make changes when we don't have any control over immigration, we don't get to have those conversations with the federal government, how can we ever think about implementing change when if Nova Scotia were to step up and do that, we would be abused as a province. We'd have everybody entering here and moving away. So how, as a province, can we kind of make change? That's great. So maybe I can just follow up with you afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to say uh, thank you to YY for, for coming and presenting with us and uh, for really concluding, I think, our series uh, with an excellent uh, seminar. Uh, and I wanted to also give thanks to everyone for joining us uh, all year long. We really appreciated your attendance uh, and engagement. Uh, and in the spirit of appreciation, she's not here. <laughs> it's Barbara. She's coming back. I'll see you soon.
I would like to appreciate Barbara <laughs> in her absence. <laughs> My apologies, Barbara's usually here at 20 after. Um, so Barbara Carter, you may see her sometimes, and she's around, she's the administrative assistant of the Health Law Institute. Uh, and she's really just our series maestro. She orchestrates everything uh, to perfection. And so we have a small gift um, for Barbara. I'm hoping that she will arrive before the end of this sentence. <laughs> That's a great idea. Thanks. Yeah. Take on federalism. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, you know, I think that's always a tough question, right? When when the um, when we're dealing with what federal government does and what provinces do, I mean, the, my only response would be, you know, I think there needs to be. Uh, when it comes to migration health issues, right? I think there needs to be greater inter-jurisdictional um, discussions, right? That's, I mean, that, that's, that would be my, I realize that. Um, I, you know, it doesn't really happen. Um, it should happen more. Um, and, you know, it should part, be part of our, um, both our immigration um, policy making and also part of our healthcare um, portfolio. For the federal government, right? To think about how that will work. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. All right, Barbara, we were giving you a round of appreciation and applause. <laughs> we have a small gift here for you and just wanted to say thank you so much for all of your help in making uh, this series, I think, a success over the year. Um, and so, uh, we very much uh, look forward to welcome you back uh, next year uh, for our 2018-19 uh, series. So thanks again, everyone.